Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Darren. I'm head of emissions, emissions tutor at BSMS. Uh, and I am going to just give you a really quick run through of who BSMS are. Um, just so you get a little bit of an insight into who we are as a school, how we do things um, and the way we like to operate. There's an opportunity to ask questions. What we do is we'll use the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen for questions, not the chat. So we won't answer anything that's in the chat. You need to use the Q&A box. Um, and basically that's also quite useful because um, as if someone asks a question you want to ask, um, you can uh, upvote a question. Okay. Um, and we will do that. For, we've got a question already in there. We'll come to the questions at the end. So we'll be joined um, uh, in about 20 minutes by a current BSMS student who will um, who will answer some of the questions about student life, being a student at BSMS. Uh, folks, it's really useful if, if you instead of asking a question, when you look in the q and box, you can see what's being asked. It's easier to press the thumbs up and upvote the question rather than typing out again, because the two questions that we've got already are virtually the same. So let's try to just keep it to a minimum. I'm going to start the presentation. So um, welcome to BSMS. We, um, if I can get my screen to move forward. There we go. Who we are. The BSMS are a fairly young medical school here in the UK, We're in the south of England, based um, in uh, the city of Brighton and Hove in the county of Sussex. And uh, we are approaching our 20th year. So we opened our doors to our first students in September 2023. So in September, it'd be 20 years that we've been in business. You can see on the screen there, it's an equal partnership between the University of Brighton, the University of Sussex and the NHS trusts and our students have um, full membership of both universities with access to institutions. Here's our ethos statement. I'm not going to read that out. I'm just going to give you a few moments to take that in and to read it and then I'll make a comment on it. Okay. So it's a fairly uh, um, obvious statement I don't really need to explain it but what's really important from our perspective is that last paragraph and our commitment to equality and diversity and that's reflected through everything we do that's reflected in how we um, try to choose the students that come it's reflected in our when we select our staff and uh, you know it's reflected in our teaching and hopefully in the students that we have who then go on to carry that notion of equality and diversity into their practice when they become doctors. So why would you choose BSMS? Well, if you know anything about the city of Bright Brighton and Hove, you'll know that that's one reason why you might want to come and study with us. Yeah, it's a vibrant, bustling city. It's a great place to be a student. It's often uh, referred to as London by the sea. It's got an awful lot going for it. It's got lots of lots of stuff for people to do and people to enjoy. But actually, we need to remember that you're going to come to Brighton and Hove to be a semester study to be a doctor. So let's talk a little bit about us as a school. So we have strong emphasis on developing your clinical skills, and that starts right from the beginning of the course. So you'll start to learn those clinical skills almost immediately, um, and that clinical training will also help develop your communication skills and how you work with patients. It's important for us that you um, learn how to deal with patients. The GMC want patients to uh, medicine to be patient centred, so we have a patient focused approach to our teaching. And we have an integrated systems-based approach to dealing with our non-clinical teaching. So we, each term will focus, in the first two years, we'll focus on a system of the body. So for example, um, in term two of the first year, it's heart, lungs, and blood. So it's everything around the thoracic region. Uh, we also still use um, a, a, quite a bit of full cadaveric dissection. So you'll, you'll dissect a human being to supplement your anatomy teaching, but anatomy is also taught in other ways through imaging, um, through um, computer simulation and a lot of prosected um, dissection. So you'll have a, 
Uh, perhaps if you're dissecting the upper limb, you'll have a, an upper limb just to work on that's been partly prepared for you to save you some time. Lots of different ways of teaching, lots of learning modes, uh, quite a few um, small group sessions that are for, help us to provide a friendly and supportive atmosphere for you. A wide range in the first three years of student selected components, the SSC. They uh, they don't take up a huge amount of your teaching, but they are an, and they're an opportunity for you to try and choose a, a particular strand around the uh, in the module you're doing. So, for example, in the past, in heart, lungs, and blood, we've had doing a comic book to describe the heart. We've had um, creative writing, uh, teaching um, sessions about the heart to uh, secondary school kids. So, there's lots of variety in the FSC, which Bring in, which makes it an exciting pro prospect. Lots of opportunities to feedback. We have student forums, staff student forums. We have a student affairs committee where and student reps who will feedback to the school the concerns that students might have and also the things that they find positive. And we try where possible to feed in some of the feedback we get to help them develop the curriculum and develop the student experience. You'll do a research projects wherever you go but we'll we're pretty proud of the vast range of choice that our students get and again that's across the board it'll be uh, clinical based it can be lab based it can be community based education based so a wide range of exciting projects that you'll do when you reach year four so i've already mentioned we're committed to modern patient focused education so that's why we've got the clinical skills early on so you're not going to come in a first year and be able to do things you know we're going to teach you the very basics to start with how to use a stethoscope how to listen to the heart you know how to take a pulse uh, the, the basics that you see happening day to day and on that we'll build upon your communication skills how do you interact with patients how do you take a history you know that's a vital part of being a doctor particularly um in primary care you know if you ask the right questions you can get to the bottom of a problem quite easily you um also need to develop your communication skills because you need to be able to communicate with people from different backgrounds and when you become a doctor you'll have you'll have had five years of a really good education you'll know your stuff you know the scientific terms the medical terms and you're going to be dealing with people who English may not be their first language. They might be scared and worried about what's going on. You might be teaching to someone, you know, who's elderly and infirm or a young child. You need to be able to communicate what's going on in a clear and effective way so they understand what you're saying. So that forms a big part of the patient-focused education. So this slide shows you the course structure and how we break things up. So years one and two, you're primarily on campus at Falmer, at the University of Sussex and the University of Brighton. Two separate campuses, they're about a 10-minute walk from each other, just um, yeah, an underpass which takes you under the main road and you're on one or other campuses. The picture there in the phase one column, that's the medical school teaching building on the University of Sussex campus. And in there we've got um, the anatomy suite, the detection labs, lots of seminar teaching and our teaching rooms and our main lecture theatre. In phase two, years three or four, primarily based in a clinical environment, hospitals in Brighton and Hove and the Princess Royal Hospital in Hove's Heath. And the picture there is of the Orgy Emerton building, which is our teaching facility that's located within the trust right opposite the, the county hospital in Brighton and Hove. And then year three, which is year five, it's regional ro ro uh, rotations. Um, you'll have three rotations in one of the hospitals that you can see listed there. That's Chichester, Worthing, Brighton, Eastbourne, Haysford, things. Was here from Red Hill, and actually, by the time you, if you come to some of us, by the time you get um, to uh, fifth year, we will probably have uh, more uh, uh, attachments online. So on online, as in for you to access, not online virtually. So phase one, years one and two. Here's what the your um, timetable will look at. So you can see. In each year, there's this module runs the whole through the whole academic year. That's clinical and community practice, such clinical skills that we've already referred to. Your first module in year one, Foundation of Health and Disease, gets everyone up to speed, everyone at the same level. Got people coming from different backgrounds, you know, different educational backgrounds. We'll have some um, 
well, a majority would be A level students or college leavers or IB or the equivalent. There'd be some graduates, there'd be some people who've had a small break in their education. There might be access to medicine students or foundation students who've come through on a foundation course. So we want to get everyone up to speed in that first module. After the winter break, when you come back in January, you've got heart, lungs and blood, which I've already referred to. Um, and the, the, the level jumps. So it goes from first year undergraduate work and it jumps to second year level undergraduate work after only a term. So you need to be prepared for a big increase in what's expected of you academically. And you can see there all the different systems that we have. I'll tell you now that the first module in year two, neuroscience and behavior is the one that all our students say is the hardest in the first two years, because you don't do an awful lot around neuroscience and the brain in biology at college. So it comes as a bit of a, a jolt to most students, but I get through it. Personal and professional development runs throughout the course uh, the year as well. And at the end there, you can see in the summer, you've got the um, integrated KT, the knowledge test. That's your end of year exams that you have to pass in order to progress. And in the second year, you can see they're struggling May and June the OSCE, the Objective Structured Clinical Exam. So that's where we test your um, clinical skills. Okay, phase two, yeah, three. So you can see we've got medicine, surgery, elderly medicine and psych. Those are your basic rotations in the clinical environment. SBM, the scientific basis of medicine, that's the science that underpins the clinical stuff you learn. Therapeutics, big module running through there. What do you need to do to help make people better? Personal and professional development, again, that runs through the whole course. That's a common thing you're going to get used to. Uh, and then we've got an OSCE and another knowledge test at the end of the year. At the end of three, uh, year three, uh, there's an option, and it is an option for students to integrate. So take a year out of medicine, step away for a year to do the last year of a BSc or to do an MSc in a year. Um, and you can see... At BSMS, we offer a number of MSc opportunities, but we've got two parent institutions, two parent universities who offer BSc opportunities. So neuroscience, uh, biochemistry, things like that. So you'd spend the last year, you join that cohort for last year and you'd get your degree. There's also opportunities to go to other institutions. It's totally um, voluntary. No one has to intercalate. Uh, and obviously we discussed that with you closer to the time. Okay. Phase two, year four. More specialist rotations, we'll come to those in a minute. You've got the research project. You can see that forms quite a big chunk of the year. More personal and professional development. And again, another OSCE and another KT at the end of the year. Oh, where are we going? I'm going. Sorry. Okay. Year five. So this is where we have your regional attachments. You can see quite a big block of your year. And it's, I guess the best way to describe that, it, it would be on the job training. Uh, so you're you're being part of a firm, part of a clinical rotation. You'll be on the job, working in the hospital, learning uh, as you work with patients and consultants and other junior doctors. So it's it's putting all everything you've learned during the four years into practice but also having the, uh, the, the access to um, being able to ask questions. We'll bring you back in for some per personal professional development and we'll also do seminars on campus occasionally throughout the year just to bring you up to speed academically. Big chunk of revision for you before the MLA. So the MLA um, is, going, is replacing a final. So previously... Each medical school would have their own set of final exams at the end of the course, and people obviously have to pass them. The MLA is coming. It's been devised by the General Medical Council. So all medical schools will run the MLA at the same time, and everyone will sit the same exam. So it's, a, it's basically a, a finals exam that is standard across the board. After that, you can see we've got Foundation Zero and Elective. So Foundation Zero is um, where we prepare you for being a junior doctor. So you'll do um, a, a stint of uh, four day weeks in the clinical setting, uh, and then one day a week back on campus to um, have a symposium around a subject that you would have been looking for in your foundation clinical um, activities. 
and the electives. So that's an opportunity to go off for four weeks anywhere that isn't Brighton and Hove to practice medicine. So you can go overseas, stay in the UK, but again, you go off and practice your skills. About half our students will go to the developing world. They feel they want to give something back and 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 go and and be of value somewhere. And and a lot will stay. I say a lot will stay in the UK. And some will go to some of the more affluent countries in the West, i.e., Australia, the States, uh, Canada, and see medicine from a different aspect uh, to the NHS. And then you can see there right at the end, graduation, and then you're off. You're going to be a doctor. So how'd you get in for BSMS? That's the important bit for you guys right now, isn't it? So um, we do not use the personal statement. Personal statement doesn't form any part of our process. We ask our students to sit the BMAT. That comes to an end this year. So you'll be the last, if you're applying in October, you'll be the last cohort of students who will use the BMAT. And we use your BMAT score to select for interview. What we'll do is we rank according to your total score. We give extra emphasis on the science section, but we rank according to the total score and go down the list until we've reached the number of people we want to interview. In order to uh, progress, you've also got to meet our GCSE requirements, just maths and English at grade six. That's all we're asking. We do not, we're not worried about other GCSE requirements. Uh, we also are trying to widen access into medicine, so, so we use contextual data. That information is all on the website. You can find that on the website. If you qualify for contextual data, you'll get a slightly reduced GCSE offer. So it's a grade five at Maths and English and also a slightly reduced A-level offer. So I'm going to talk in terms of A-levels because that's about 80% of our applicants. So three A-levels, all at grade A biology, chemistry, and one other. We don't mind what that one other is, so this is a grade A. If your contextual data is AAB, is the standard offer. If you're sitting in the IB, it's 36 points overall with biology and chemistry at grade six higher. And if you're coming as a graduate, then you need to have got BBB in your A-levels, and then you need to have an, an uh, be doing a BSc, a science degree that we feel has enough biology and chemistry in it so normally people are doing biomedical sciences biochemistry um they tend to be uh, they're, they're fine that tends to be the one that we see the most but if you're not sure if your science degree has enough biology and chemistry in it then you need to get in touch and just ask us if you're selected for interview it will be an mmi mini multiple interview we have five interviews each last in 10 minutes and the process, that purpose is to just see who you are and what you are as a person. So uh, it's to go beyond your academics to delve a bit deeper into your understanding of medicine, um, perhaps your understanding of the NHS, uh, and to just to see how, what you know about um, how science is used in medicine, how we deal with people in medicine. Um, we don't have any requirements on work experience but we do expect you to have an understanding of medicine and to have got that from somewhere. Uh, it may well be work experience, but it can be from research, from reading to talking to people. Uh, we have a virtual work experience tool at BSMS that anyone can access that can help build your insight. The other suggestion we make to everyone is that you make sure you understand how the NHS works because that's bound to come up. Uh, and look for its values. Google NHS values. What are they? What do they mean? Why are they important? And how do you think they um, are put into practice in medicine? Okay, complete whistle stop. We hopefully will be joined by a student shortly who will be talking about um, student life at BSMS. We have something called MedSoc. I guess, guess it's the student union for the medics at BSMS. It's, it, um, looks after the student body. It's an umbrella organisation for all the societies and um, the clubs and organise events uh, and get togethers for the student body. Um, if I, if you come and see us at our open day on the 3rd of June, they'll be there and yeah, they're, they're worth talking to. Okay, I will stop sharing. Uh, Chrissy's here, great. Excellent. So I'm going to go through, start going through the questions. And then if there's a question that I feel 
is better suited for Chrissy to answer because it's student related. We'll ask them to respond. So when did when did you start preparing for UCAT and BMAT? So I suspect that's probably for Chrissy. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, how long do you need to spend devoted to UCAT and BMAT revision? How long's a piece of string? Uh, you know, that's down to you to answer. I don't know about UCAT. So we don't use UCAT. We just use the BMAT. Um, you don't need to buy any resources. You don't need to pay for any courses to learn how to do the BMAP. If you go onto the website, they have perfectly adequate revision resources. They have past papers that you can sit. They have the expected knowledge guide. So basically they're saying, this is what we expect you to understand and want to know. So it will have all the things that they are like, the subject areas are likely to be in the test. And then you go through that. And if you don't know something, you can go off and revise and prepare for it. So that's how you do that. I don't know how you need to do that. It's up to you. Christy, do you want to just sort of say when you start preparing for BMAT? Yeah, of course. Um, it won't let me turn my video on. I'm oh, okay. that's, um, it says it's been disabled. Oh, I don't know. About I'm not that. sure if that's on your end. It might have been. I, I, you're asking the wrong person. To that's to... fine. We can leave it. Um, but hi, everyone. My name's Chrissy. I'm one of the current fourth years. Um, so, yeah, in terms of preparing for BMAT and UCAT, I only actually applied to Brighton for, for the BMAT. So I had a heavier focus on UCAT to begin with. Um, and also just because the UCAT is a bit of a different type of exam. It's got things like verbal reasoning and sort of different skills, whereas the BMAT uses more your biology, chemistry, um, knowledge that you've got from your GCSEs um, and it also has an essay section so I guess if you struggle with writing essays then that might be something to look into. Personally I would say um, kind of mirroring what Darren said there's no there's you, the earlier the better basically but realistically I probably didn't start proper revision and practice papers until the summertime just before so yeah I'd say a good four to eight weeks would be perfect and you'd probably be fine. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Chrissy. OK, there's a couple of questions about the recording. We are recording this. Uh, if We will email you a link to the recording. Uh, Isabella, I've just noticed you're going on the tour and hopefully we've got to in time, but you're receiving an email anyway um, to tell you. OK, do you have to choose the accommodation from the loan list on the website? Yes, you do. That's all that's available if you're going to live on campus. Uh, if once you receive your offer, if you accept your offer, you'll be sent information about accommodation you'll, you'll have a choice but the sooner you return it return the paperwork the more likely you are to get your first choice it can't be guaranteed but you are guaranteed um accommodation on campus in the first year and it is only the first year after that you'll be um accommodation locally in the public sector okay um if we're doing four A levels and successful in an application, we would receive an offer full four. No, it's just our offer is our standard offer. Our only offer will be three A's at A level, biology, chemistry, and one other. So no, you will not be. You won't be relevant. How important do you think the EPQs are, and how much do you look at them during an application? I don't have an opinion on how important they are because we don't use them as part of our offer making, so they won't be used in the application. What I'll say is there's a possibility that uh, you know, the research you might have done for an EPQ might come up in an exam in a, an MMI question um, in which case you'll have uh, the ability to make a stronger better answer um, but you know for us it's something that we don't put any value on in in terms of the application process okay another one about recording yeah done with that Okay, no, we don't use personal statements at all in any part of the process. So we don't read them even in the interview. Uh, EPQ, do I like it? I've just answered the EPQ question. We're rattling through the question. How does the foundation medical year work? Do you recommend? I don't understand what you mean. The foundation medical year work. Do you want to put a bit more detail in on that? I don't, I don't get it. Um, so a bit more detail, unless you're talking about foundation year one, which is post-graduation. So put a bit more detail and we'll come back to that one. What replaces BMAT for 2025 entry? Don't know yet. We haven't had the conversation about it. Uh, when we know, we will put it on the website. 
What is the cohort size at BSMS? Okay, and right, and do you allow A level reset? So our cohort is 193 home students, 10 international students, so 203 students a year. We do allow A level resets, but only if you've dropped a grade, one grade in one subject. So if you're if you you offer us AAA and you've got AAB, you could come as a reset, but if you've got if you're not for your first seat and you got three Bs, we wouldn't allow you to reset. So you can only drop one grade in one subject. What would happen if you can't afford accommodation, but the price range is the other one that price range? Well, what will happen? You'll have to you'll have to find something else. <laughs> you, any medical school, in fact, any university that you apply to to do any course the expectation is you can afford to pay to you to look up to live whether that's with a loan or whatever you know there the expectation is that you from our end is that you can afford to do the course so you know if you couldn't afford the accommodation then you'd you well you wouldn't be able to come and study with us i guess is the answer you know we are we are not able to help you out on that in that respect we don't have the funding to do that so you need to make sure you can afford it. It's as simple as that. You know, Brighton and Hove is the most expensive city to be a student in the UK outside of London. So you need to bear that in mind. You need to do. You need to see what the current prices are in, you know, in the private landlord sector to make sure you can afford that. Perhaps Chrissy can tell us what she's done post first year. On costs and give a bit of an idea about the cost of living in Brighton and Hove yeah of course um it's definitely very difficult um I mean it you obviously don't get any increased loan like you do in London um but there are ways to be smart about it obviously it's one of those things you just have to use all the deals you can to your advantage if you can walk to places it's great um and definitely consider in second year and beyond just getting accommodation that's walking distance to the campus and then likewise when you're at the hospital um, in third years onwards try and get accommodation near there because that reduces your travel costs significantly um, it, you can make time for part-time work obviously I do bright med alongside things and you can take up little jobs as and when it's definitely feasible um, it's just one of those things that you might have to watch your money more so than if you were maybe up north but it's got its perks there's a lot of great things about Brighton and Hove so don't let that put you off at all yeah, great. That's really useful. Yeah, just you just you know, I, I get the question. You know, what happens if you can't? I I understand that it's a worry for people. I wasn't being trying to be flippant about it, other than the fact that you need to be able to afford it. Um, Sorry yeah. to just chip in there. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, please I was do. actually eligible for um, what they call a first, I think it was called a first generation scholar. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was actually really good for me because there were some other unis that I wasn't eligible for that because I didn't meet their requirements. So if you do have like financial struggles or you think you might be eligible, just make sure to look for any grants because that offered me, I think, maybe 2000 in my first year. It obviously changes, but that really helped me anyway to sort of afford that extra cost that maybe I wouldn't have had if I was elsewhere. Yeah, that's useful. Thanks, Chrissy. Although I will add that the, that grant that Chrissy got doesn't exist to be a semester students anymore. So, all, so when you're looking, also have a look at the University of Brighton site at their funding options, because all of our funding, extra funding, is provided by the University of Brighton. Okay. Do you accept GCSE reset? Yeah, we're not worried about resets on on at GCSE. As long as you meet our requirements, you can reset. That's not an issue for us at all. Interviews will be online certainly for the next cycle. Uh, beyond that, we again we haven't discussed yet. But you know, anyone applying in October to start in 2024, their interviews will be conducted online. Uh, those applying to mature students via access. Is the GCSE requirement still six or B for both maths and English? Yes, the GCSE requirement is the same for everyone. So everyone who's applying, and if obviously if you haven't done GCSEs, it's an equivalent or the IELTS exam. But yeah, um, everyone has to meet our maths and English requirements. So if you're doing think of access and you've got a grade five in English, you'll have to resit English to get the six. A specific question about oh, it's gone. I was just about to read a question about drama and it disappeared off my screen. I think you were dealing Sorry, with Sorry, Darren, I'm answering some in the that's chat. Right. That's right. I thought you were answering. That's cool. That's good. That's brilliant. 
acceptance rate acceptance rate last year was bonkers it's the highest in the 15 years i've been responsible for missions it was up to 76 percent of people who were offered accepted it's normally around about 55 percent and i suspect this year it will drop back down um but you know acceptance rate isn't relevant to you because you know if you get the offer you're in you know except the acceptance rate is just the number of people who say yes when make an offer that's how i term the acceptance rate Bree, you may have a different you may be actually be asking something else and just using a different terminology. So if, you, if that's not quite your answer, pop it in the questions again. How does BSMS help their students once they leave? Well, you'll, you've left and you're off into the world of work. You know, we, we, will, we will have prepared you for working in the NHS. We'll give you a lot of advice and guidance leading up to graduation and going into foundation year, and you'll meet junior doctors who'll talk about our experience. But you know, once you've graduated and gone off and joined the NHS, you could be anywhere in the UK. So yeah, they're, they're, we don't hold your hand. If you want to be a doctor, you need to show some resilience and you need to get on with it. So yeah, we won't be holding your hand once you've left. We'll welcome you back. We'd like we'd like to see you, but that's about it. Uh, I'm currently on a gap year, received an offer last, this year, and I'm happy to say I have accepted it. I've been working. How do you revise? I've been wondering, how do you revise in medical school? Do you have textbooks? Do you have a fixed curriculum? Just curious. Chrissy, over to you on that one. I think that's probably the best. Yeah, you, that's yeah? fine. Um, there's so many different ways to study. Um, I think one big thing that I learned was when I came to uni that the way that I studied for my A-levels is not how I could study for medicine. So a lot of people get quite panicked because they get here and they're doing what they were doing during A-levels and it doesn't show in your grades. So I'd just say the biggest thing is don't come to uni and buy all the textbooks. They're expensive. They might not work for you. You can often buy them off students at a much cheaper price. So that's one top dip, I'd say. Um, and two, um, yeah, just try out all the different techniques. Some people like flashcards. Some people make notes. Literally every student in my year uses different things. So there's not one technique for everyone. Personally, I need to do a mix of everything. And that's how I learn. But you'll definitely figure it out in the first few months. And don't be scared if you're not getting the grades that you want straight away, because that happens to a lot of med students. It's a completely different way of learning. Yeah, sorry, because I didn't speak up. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, actually. Don't, you know, um, you know, most medic, most, most students when they start medical school are used to being high achievers. You know, they're, they're doing really well, done really well at school, possibly right up their top performers in their school. And then you come to medical school, and not just be a semester any medical school, and then all of a sudden you're surrounded by people who are very similar. And yeah, medicine is a different way of learning. It can be tough. There's a lot, a lot to remember. Um, and some people then all of a sudden aren't getting top marks. And that can be quite worrying for some people. And some people don't deal with that very well. But remember, you just you need to pass. I know we want to do the best we can. But, you know, you know, you just need to pass. It's a pass fail course. You know, yeah, a... one one tip on that as well, I'll just add is when you pass an exam, it might not seem as great as when you were getting your A's and stuff at your GCSEs and your A-levels, but a pass in medicine is is great. Like if you've passed, you're reaching the standard you need to be a doctor. So it's not something to be like, oh, I only just passed and everyone else is doing better than me because most of the people at your med school have all been those top achievers across the country, across other countries. It's it's not helpful to compare yourself to others. And that's definitely something I struggled with when I first came. Absolutely. So try not to do that. A really good point and a really common point for a lot of our students. Um, so it won't just be you, Chris, as I'm sure you're aware. OK, uh, do you take GCSE grades into question? Yes. Maths and English, grade six. That's all we look at. I don't understand this question. What kind of impact has BSMS had on, has had on your intake, intake towards medicine? That makes absolutely no sense, I'm afraid. Uh, so you might want to type that one again. Uh, no, we don't look at IBE assessments as a GCSE equivalent. Oh, no, what do we? Um, oh, gosh. So we don't get that very often. We norm mm, No, we don't. It would normally be the, the GCSE that, that you've equivalent within your high school setting before IB. Uh, you'll have to get in touch and tell us what you've got. Um, I, I rarely look at GCSEs. It's done by other people. So I'm, I'm a bit, yeah, we don't. It would be the equivalent at high school before IB is what we would look at. 
Uh, about four to five hundred international students will apply each year on average, um, and we'll interview about eighty of them. Is there is there rowing at Brighton and Sussex? I have no idea. Chris, have you got any idea? Is there a rowing club? I'm really sorry. That's not. I know that be my specialty, but if you want, uh, if you're there interested, there used to be a sailing. Sorry, yeah. mate. There used to be a sailing club. I know there there was once a sailing club. I know they're very different. Sports, yeah, I think sure. it's really easy if you go on the Sussex website and look at the societies and then go on Brighton website and look at their societies. It's obviously difficult for students because they don't understand that you can join both, but you're allowed to join any society in Sussex or Brighton. So they probably have it because you've got two unis to pick out of. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and you know what, if there isn't, if there's enough pick rows around, you can start a society. So, um yeah, English, it can be English language or English lit, so long as it's a grade six. Uh, ratio of students interviewed who get an offer. So about 60% of those we interview will get an offer. Uh, we don't look at ASs, so we don't worry about AS, AS resets. Um, do you look at predicted A-level grades? Yes, we do. So you need to be predicted AAA. If you're predicted lower than AAA, you won't progress unless you've got contextual data. So you need to be predicted our minimum standard offer. How do you re recommend to revise the interview? You can't revise the interview because, you know, we don't, we, we haven't even written the questions yet. So we don't know. We haven't had any ideas about what we're going to do. So be up to speed in your understanding of medicine and how it works. The role of a doctor, the NHS, and how it works. I'm not interested in Nye Bevan and the foundation of the NHS just over 60 years ago and or whatever it was, longer than that now, isn't it? And just I'm not interested in any of that. Um, history's no use to you at all. But how does the NHS function? Okay. Um what's what's it like in a day-to-day -day, um working in the NHS? What's its future look like, you know? Um, the values of the NHS, as I've already said, are really important. Chrissy, do you want to just add anything that you might have done to prepare for BSMS? It, yeah, definitely. I'd say the, my BSMS one was actually my favourite interview. It's a lovely environment. Um, and because they're longer stations, I'd just say just prepare for things that you can imagine talking to someone about for 10 minutes. Um, like Darren said, you're going to get questions, you know, around sort of your core values and beliefs. If you just read up on sort of the basics of what a junior doctor is, what the kind of um, things that you need to have, like empathy, skills, things like that. And yeah, just be prepared to answer sort of like questions that maybe you've not thought about before. Um, it, it's it's not something I'd say that you're gonna go into and know the answer straight away. It's more about they're looking at how you can answer it and the way that you speak and communicate. And that that's the main thing about an interview, I'd say, even if you haven't got it right or you haven't got exactly what they want you to say, it's more about how you word things and how you communicate with the interviewer. Um, so yeah, all my interviews are so different from each other. I don't think there's anything I could have done specifically to prepare. It's more just having some background knowledge about medicine and then, yeah, just giving it a good go. Yeah, I think that's fair, fair advice. Yeah, just, and, you know, as you get close to it, read around, read around medicine and developments and advances in health and science and and just just get friends and family to ask you questions even random questions and just so that you answer you get used to answering questions that you where you're put on the spot um one other key thing to look at is like the current like healthcare news so at the moment yeah. if you would have an interview it'd be they might ask you about what you think about the strikes or um, during COVID, it might be to do with vaccines and things like that. So just look at what's in the news and that would probably be quite useful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the year, the year that COVID broke, we were, you know, it was broken over in China. We knew this thing was around. We were hearing more and more and more about it. Um, so we, we, we asked questions around vaccines because we thought, you know, how that might be pertinent. Um, and then we linked in to what have you heard about COVID? Um, so yeah, just be up to speed on things. BMAT, Elizabeth O, it's the BMAT for BSMS, and it's not BS, it's BMS, it's BSMS. It's useful to know who you're applying to. 
uh, I'm not sure if anyone's asked how does a day for a year five student look at BSMS. Well, it's, I say the majority of it is on place clinical placement, rotations in hospitals. Um, as I say, essentially being a, a an unpaid junior doctor learning on the job. Chris, you got any mates in year five who've shared? Yeah, I've seen, seen the odd few. It's not too different from year four, apart from you basically go over everything you've ever learned. You're on the wards. You are kind of a glorified junior that's not getting paid, but it's really valuable experience. Um, and it's kind of your final chance to like brush up on all your clinical skills, get your final things signed off, study for exams. Um, it's yeah every fifth year I've met really enjoy it you just have to immerse yourself in that work environment while you're a student so that when you graduate you're prepared yeah yeah I wouldn't start worrying about what the day for a fifth year looks like you've got to get through first year first. yeah I've only just started worrying about it and I'm nearing the end of fourth year so I really wouldn't worry too much <laughs> one day at a time or one academic year at a time is the way it's the fifth year will come around soon enough and by the time it does you'll be prepared for it so um uh would you say the campus is culturally diverse i think so, yeah i would say it is it's it i mean i've worked there for 20 years and it's certainly got more culturally diverse um you know at the turn of the century it would have been fair to say that the county of sussex the city of brighton Hove, was a pretty white place um but yeah, it certainly has got more culturally diverse over the years. And yeah, I think most uh, most uh, races and religions and cultures are represented. Um, yeah, so I think most people should feel relatively at home uh, on campus. Would you agree with that, Chrissy? I'd say so, yeah. Um, I, th I think it's, I actually think it's a really diverse place here, I think. And there's so, there's so much to do um, for people from different cultures. There's just, there's so many activities and, you know, things aren't always focused on like drinking, where some unis are. Um, it just really depends what you're into. But there's a, there's a place for everyone, I would say. I feel like everyone feels like home here. There's a lot of international students in Brighton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so where do you look at news and research? So uh, the BBC... Pages are a good start, good quality um, broadsheet newspaper, newspapers, um, period, periodicals, uh, journals, magazines like Nature are a good place to look. Um, yeah, you just you know go to the like go to your local library, go to your school and college library, and just have a look. Um, just try and keep up to date with developments. Watch the news um do private schools be less likely to get in well we don't private schools don't come to the bsms i assume you mean students from private schools no we don't worry about what school you go to we worry about whether or not you're good enough to come and study at bsms so if you know your stuff if you're on track and you do well at interview you'll get in it doesn't matter where you're educated uh if we go to bsms are we in sussex or brighton university um so when you're on campus most of your time will be on sussex you'll have some time on the brighton campus if you're living on campus then you'll if you're whichever one you you're on as i've said there it's about a 10 minute walk from one to the other so you're pretty you're close if you're living in the city of brighton and hove or near to falmer which is the area of brighton where the campus is um there's buses every 10 minutes from the city centre, there's trains every 20 minutes. The train will take, I think it's nine minutes from Brighton Station to Farmer. Uh, so, yeah, it really is. Or you can cycle. There's lo cycle lanes all over the city. So getting in and out of the campus isn't really an issue. Um, sort of percentage of people into college. Do you know what? I don't know anymore. I, that's, that's a bit I don't have anything to do with. I, I'd like to say it was a, about 40%, but I don't know anymore. Chrissy, did... It, it yeah, yeah, our year, year we had actually, I think, the maximum amount that's allowed to, and usually it's 40 to 50 percent. Um, we lost quite a lot of our year to interpolation, actually, which isn't always common, but I'd say it's roughly 40 to 50 percent. Most of the time, if you want to, they'll allow you to, unless you're really you, you've shown signs that you've been struggling a lot the year before, they might discourage you from interpolation. But most of the time, the people that wanted to were able to do it. Cool, thanks for that. Great. Dropout rate or end of year failure rate is really small, really low. Again, don't why are you worrying about that? 
why are you worrying about the failure rate? You're going to do well. If you're going to come, you're going to do well. It's very true. Um, and we give people chances. You know, you don't just fail an exam and you're gone. You know, there's opportunities to reset, to retake. Some people take might find they struggle and they retake the whole year again. And then they get through. You know, I've had people graduate who had to reset the whole of first year or the whole of second year or the whole of third year or the whole of fifth year and eventually get there. You know, um, there's lots of support. You know, we're, we're not in the business of failing people you know people fail it's if you for one of a better weapon it's a last resort for us for people to fail that's not why we're here you know we're here to turn good students good young people or well not necessarily young people but mature students as well good applicants into doctors into medics so yeah it's not in our interest for people to fail so you know don't don't worry about failure rates it is very low um, how many people get an interview from the applications around in if the home students are around about 650 ish it will depend but it's around that figure <laughs> um what happens if you fail one of your exams do you retake the year no as i just said you might just have to reset the exam you might have to reset the year um if you've failed previously if you fail everything you might be asked to leave but again let's not worry about that uh, are there opportunities for doing medical research throughout the years at BSMS? There are. I, again, it's something I don't have anything to do with anymore. I don't do, um, I don't do research projects anymore. So I don't know. Chrissy, do you want to help me out there? What sort of research? Yeah, definitely. So in fourth year, you have to do a mandatory research project. So that is every Monday. Um, you do it for about eight months in total, um, and a ballot comes out the year before and you sort of rank which project you're interested in if you're really interested in research you can actually apply to do your own one you just have to find a supervisor that's willing to sort of look over it um I find it really good I never used to be interested in research but actually it's got me quite interested in it um you submit your projects most of them are like either systematic reviews they might be sort of audit style research you'll submit that and then you have to do a conference style thing with other students um in May so it's a really good opportunity. A lot of students can get their research published. Um, yeah, so I'd really, I'd really recommend if you're interested in it to maybe try and set up your own project um, in, in the third year. Obviously, it's not something to worry about now. But also, if you're interested in research in general, there are so many doctors here that love to do audits with students. So if there's something you're particularly interested in, definitely just email the med school about it. And I'm sure they can put you in touch with someone. I know a lot of students that have done extra research alongside the degree. So yeah. Uh, there are some questions for you, Chris. I'll leave them to the end. I'm going to go through. Yeah, that's what I can do. Um, cut off point for BMAT. So, as I said, we get your total score, we rank everyone until we've got the number of interviews we want. So, there isn't a set cut off score. Will voluntary work within a hospital be a benefit, make it more likely to be offered an interview? It'll have absolutely no impact on whether you get an interview because we just use the BMAT score to select for interview. How heavily weighted is BMAT? Well, it's the thing that we select to give you an interview, so it's quite heavily weighted. Um, how do we take the exam if you're on your school or college? If you're referring to the BMAT, go onto the website, find a test centre close to you and register, and they will send you all the details of where to go. There will there should be a test centre near to most people. Uh, if you have a British passport and never lived in the UK, in my class, and yes, you're an international student. If you've never lived in the UK, you have to be resident, permanent resident for at least three years um, to be classed as a British uh, a home fee student. Uh, average BMAT score, uh, I, the averages or the cutoff scores are listed on a website. I don't have them on the top of my head. It's not something I need to remember. So you'll have to look at the BMAT section of our website to find out what the cutoffs have been for previous years. I think we've listed the last 10 years for our cutoff scores okay that's the general questions we're near we're nearly done for time so let's over to you chrissy i'll read them out if you don't mind i know you can read but i'll i'll do it <laughs> that's chrissy, fine. Can, can you tell me more about the time for dementia program oh, that's a great question someone's been doing a bit of research how do you find it yeah, so um, I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, so ours was unfortunately during COVID time, so it was a little bit different. Um, but the way it sort of works is you get allocated a uh, um, family, a time for dementia family. It's usually the person living with dementia and either their care or their spouse, or in some cases it's their son or daughter. Um, and the way it usually works is you go and visit them in their home environment. You have about an hour visit with yourself and your partner. 
you um, sort of chat to them about what it's like to live with dementia. You can go with specific questions for the family. Um, and it's really valuable because I hadn't had any prior experience to um, seeing people with, living with dementia. Um, so it sort of gives you that experience that you can then take forward and use in the hospital and um, for your further career. So I really enjoyed it. And it also helps you to do reflections as well, because after the visits, you have to sort of reflect on what you spoke about and points that maybe the the person living with dementia felt that they weren't sort of getting from healthcare, for example, or things that they wish society could change. So it really does give you a good outlook on what it's like for someone to live with dementia. So yeah, I found it really valuable. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, why did you choose study medicine and also why BSL medicine? And did you choose, and also at BSL medicine, I assume, I mean, why, uh, why BSL? Yeah, that's fine. Um, very good question. <laughs> um, it's a very difficult one to answer, to be honest, but um, it's just something I've always been interested in. I wanted a career that was, you know, related to healthcare, helping others, um, very stereotypical answer, but that was just what I wanted to do. Um, but I also looked just like to the fact that it was quite a holistic course. There were so many things I could go into in the future. Um, and why did I choose BSMS? Um, I really liked the uni when I came to view it. I just got a really good feeling about it when I came. I, I don't know how to describe that really, but it was just, I came and I felt really welcomed. Everyone was really lovely here. The students were lovely. And I really liked the fact that it was a smaller medical school. Some medical schools are, are, are huge and you wouldn't meet half of your cohort. Um, and I thought the hospital was nice, the area is lovely. And yeah, just sort of the way that the years were broken down worked for me. I found it better to have early clinical experience, which BSMS offer, some unis don't. Um, so yeah, they're just some of my reasons. Great stuff. Um, what do you love about BSMS, Chrissy? Um, I think just echoing on from th those points, but I think specifically, probably just the way that the placements are done, like the, re the, the way that the attachments are organised, I just think it's really helpful for students. And again, the fact that it's such a small cohort, it just feels like very friendly. Everyone gets to know each other. You know people on quite a personal basis, including some of the lecturers and um, the consultants around the hospital. So you're just very welcomed and it feels like a really warm environment. Um, I'm going to answer this and then hand over to you. Have you found Brighton to be a relatively safe city, especially at night? Brighton, I think, is really safe. There's, you know, it's a busy city. There's lots of people around. You know, there, you know, like any town in the world, it it can go bang. You know, particularly over a weekend, but also like any town or city in the world, there are places that you know that are best to avoid. And if you avoid those places, you should be fine. I don't know really of any student that's had major issues around safety, but Chrissy might think differently. But that would be my point of view anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends where you live originally, because it, that might depend on what you view as being safe or not. Because for some people, it's a massive change coming to the UK um, or coming from a different part of the UK. Personally, I have never had issues. I do think, though, obviously, like anywhere, if you're going out late at night or, you know, you've got valuables on you, just like you would anywhere, you've just got to be careful and be safe. Um, I haven't found it. I haven't felt as unsafe as maybe when I go to London, if that helps anyone. If you've been to London, I, I wouldn't say it feels like that. Um, there's a lot of police present. There's a lot of support around. Everyone's very friendly. If you're lost, they'll help you most of the time. There's night buses, so you, you shouldn't really ever be left stranded on your own somewhere. And it's relatively easy to get around. And that's from someone that's really bad with my sense of direction. So you should be fine. Um, obviously, things happen. It's not, nowhere is completely safe, as Darren said. But as long as you sort of like stay with other people that you know when you first come here, and try not to go out walking really late at night along the seafront when you've just arrived, I think you'll probably be okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good advice. Okay. Uh, is there a discrepancy between people with learning disabilities and how they are treated? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but you know, if you if someone's got a learning disability, they uh, will get them to see the disability and dyslexia team. They will issue a learning support plan, and that will detail any adjustments we need to make for that student. It might be extra time in exams. It, it could be. I mean, it could be all sorts of different things. So you know, if if we know about the learning disability we'll do our best to assist students with it you know there are not you know you're not going to get a lower pass mark or anything like that but we'll do whatever we whatever's needed reasonably to help you 
complete the course so you know if you have a learning disability you need to highlight that to us so we can then get a learning support plan for you and put into place the help that you need if we don't know we can't help um we don't really i mean pbl we don't do really not in the sense of pbl there might be something that's a bit similar to it every now and again but really there's no pbl it's it's didactic teaching it's learning through doing on the job learning and a lot of clinical attachments that's how you learn but a lot of didactic teaching as well uh Chris, how did you find the first cadaveric dissection yeah, it was really good. Um, it's quite overwhelming, to be honest, the first one that you go to. I think everyone's quite nervous beforehand. So I'd just say just eat, drink lots of water, um, just go in prepared for the emotions you're going to feel. It, it is emotional. Um, and, you know, sometimes you come away from it and think, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I was just doing that. But it's great. It's it's such a good experience that a lot of students never get to have. So I'd just say come prepared and, um, yeah, just make sure you get the most out of it, because otherwise... It's a bit pointless, really, if you don't know what to expect from it. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Don't go in on an empty stomach because the formaldehyde will really do you. Won't it can make you feel really, yeah, it can make you feel really unwell. And I think some people didn't eat because they thought it'd make them feel worse. And there are people that occasionally will faint. So it's not it's not worthwhile doing that. Yeah. Make sure you have plenty of water. And, you know, if you like to go, if you like to drink alcohol, it's probably a good idea not to go and get drunk the night before and go in there with a hangover. That's a good recommendation. But also, actually, I mean, Chrissy just said it's best learning experience I've ever had being in the section room. It's amazing. So, yeah, be prepared for something that's really, really um, awe inspiring. You know, it's a privilege to do counterparty dissection. It really is. Um, Chrissy, how have you travelled around placements? Um, do they mean placements as in clinical attachments, I assume? I suspect so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you mean clinical attachments, so they can be all the way from Brighton, local area, to Eastbourne, to Hastings. So, yeah, some of them are quite far. Um, if you drive, you can drive and get travel reimbursed. If you don't drive, again, you can get train or bus and, again, get it reimbursed. Um, the, the policy at BSMS is really good. You never end up short of money for travelling further for placements. Um, so that's nothing to worry about um, but yeah apart from that um, if you've got any reasons which mean that you can't travel out of the area um, then they'll try and put you locally in Brighton so they do look at like considerations for that um, but on average most people will have at least a few weeks in either Chichester Eastbourne or elsewhere in third or fourth year but um, it's really good experience it's great to see how another hospital works and they offer free accommodation so um, yeah, it's definitely very well supported. Uh, what oversee elective are there? Well, there, there aren't any. You organise your elective yourself. That's one of your jobs to do is you organise it some, and then we sign it off. It has to be somewhere that's safe. So, you know, we wouldn't let you go to the Ukraine, for example. We wouldn't let you go to Sudan. You know, you have to be going somewhere that you, your safety, I mean, it's never guaranteed, but, you know, it's relatively guaranteed. So the overseas elective, you organise yourself. How many hours do you spend independent revising for an exam? I mean, that's, you know, that's that's a personal thing, isn't it? I mean, everyone's different. Chrissy, any? I mean, it's bath. Yeah, I answered this briefly earlier. All I'd say is when you first get to uni, a good tip I was told is for every hour of lecture or teaching you have, try and do an hour independent, roughly speaking, in first and second year, even if that's just going over the lecture, going over the notes. Um, but again, it varies for everyone. You might really understand it the first day, next you might not. So you'll just have to get to grips with the, sort of what's going in and what's not. And I'd say that's the best way to focus. I wouldn't say time is what's important. It's the way you study. Yeah, absolutely. OK, I'm the, so no more questions because we've reached the hour mark. So we'll finish off the four that we've got there to go. Um, how long is the academic year? Well, the, so it's September. It's about two weeks longer than everyone else in first and second year. And then we get you're getting up to, I can't remember, is it 46 weeks in year Four, yes yeah, very long yeah it's the longest I can't year remember. you know so you know you're not you have to remember medicine is not like other degree courses it's not like doing a history degree you know you're going to have a lot of contact time a lot of teaching you're going to have placements you're going to have placements that might be in the evening or start early you know you've got to be prepared for it there's a lot to learn and the academic years get longer as you get through. So, yeah, be, you're not going to have, when you get to full year, you're not going to have huge long summer breaks like any of your mates who've done uh, other 
degrees. Yeah, great cycle routes, routes around the campus uh, and uh, well, not on the University of Brighton campus because you don't really need to cycle. It's quite a small campus, but uh, there's a cycle pass through the Sussex campus. And as I say, there's cycle routes all over the city of Brighton and Hove. Um, <clears throat> OK, so. Do you have to? Yes, you'll have GP placements. Where's your GP placement, Chrissy? I had mine in Somerset, North Somerset, okay. um, at the start of this year. Um, it was great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, then we spread people out for those and we can have discussions if you want to go so, somewhere in particular. We've got links, a lot of links around GP placements. Do you get do you get all the experience, all the different types of placement? Well, yeah, yeah you do the placements. That's why they're there. The placements are there as part of your learning. Um, how does the free rotation works and are we able to select the? That makes no sense. So I can't give it an answer on that one, I'm afraid. Right. Okay. Um, brilliant. So hopefully that was useful. If you have questions, then drop us an email. <coughs> Excuse me. If you are able to come to our in person open day on June the 3rd, then you know you can come see the campus, meet um, various members of, of faculty, meet students and talk to them. <coughs> Uh, and obviously we've got resources online, virtual uh, open day resources and um, our perspectives. So uh, make sure you um, make the most of all the resources we've got. OK, for, we'll leave it there. It's just over an hour. Uh, Chrissy, thank you very much for your time. Uh, no worries. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And hopefully we will um, possibly see you um, at an interview in uh, January of next year. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.